Center Specialist, Dr. Jackson Crawford. I teach at the University of Colorado Boulder, previously at UC Berkeley and UCLA. Today I want to talk about uh, Odin, the chief god of the Norse pantheon, and his surprisingly, perhaps, uh, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not, a uh, strong association with death and the dead. Odin interacts almost as much with the dead as he does with the living in uh, the stories of the Norse gods preserved in the poetic and prose Eddas. Uh, as a simple example, in the poem Baldur's Draumar, uh, where Odin, uh, which is included in most translations of the poetic Edda, including mine, uh, but is not in the Codex Regius manuscript, uh, Odin uh, having heard that his son Baldr is having bad dreams, goes to hell to find out what the meaning or source of these dreams is. And uh, in hell, he wakes up a dead volva. Volva is a, uh, a seeress of which you can tell the future. And apparently, a volva who is dead is more powerful than one who is still alive because she has crossed the boundary uh, between our world and the other realms. And so she has that extra step removed. She doesn't have to make that extra step to, to commune with her fellow dead, uh, as it's implied in, for instance, the description of the vulva in uh, the Saga of Eric the Red, that part of how they get the power is the commune with the spirits, uh, presumably the spirits of the dead. So he wakes up this dead vulva and begins asking her about uh, what uh, uh, these things token in the future. We also see in, uh, in, in various different hints that Odin talks to the head of someone named Mimir. Now, in Inglinga Saga, Snorri explains that Mimir is one of the hostages of the Asir Vanir war and that it was the Vanir who cut off Mimir's head and sent him back to Odin. In this version of the story, Mimir is originally one of the Asir sent to the Vanir as a hostage after this war. I have a lot of doubts about many of the myths in Inglinga Saga and how Snorri is interpreting them, and uh, I really don't see a whole lot of justification for the notion that Mimir is one of the Asir as opposed to actually a Jotun. Um, but we read there that Odin tok hovedit ox mordi urtum theim er egi motifuna, o kvadar uvir galdra, o magna di svo atat melti vidhan, o sagdi honum marka loinda hluti. Odin took the head and smeared it with herbs that would not rot. Then he spoke magic spells over it, and he gave it the power to speak with him, and it told him many secret things, or, or fates perhaps. Luter can be a very general word, but it can also mean something allotted by fate. We also see, uh, so regardless of, of how Mimir died and, and who he is exactly, Odin is here speaking with the dead again, in the, in the form of a head, sort of like elsewhere. And uh, we also see, of course, in Hovamal, Odin speaks about speaking to dead hanged men. The twelfth spell of eighteen that he tells us he knows in that poem is this: Thot kan ek itolta ebek se o tre upi volva virgilno svo ek rist ok irunum folk at so gengergumi ok malir vid I know the twelfth spell. If I see up on a tree uh, swinging a dead hanged man, I carve so and I paint in runes so that that man walks and speaks with me. So he's very concerned and interested in speaking with the dead, uh, primarily to learn things, right? He wants to speak to the dead vulva to know uh, what's going to happen to Baldur. He wants to speak with the dead, well, I can't exactly explain that, uh, with, the, with the dead hangman. Uh, he wants to speak with Mimir because Mimir is, is famously uh, uh, knowledgeable. And in addition to cutting off Mimir's head, Odin also mutilates his own head in order to learn from Mimir in another famous story. In Voluspa, where Odin is also talking to a vulva for information about uh, the past and future. In this case, that vulva may also be dead, although she's not explicitly said to be so. Uh, the fact that she's so old implies that she may be uh, another dead vulva. Odin's woken up. Anyway, the Volvo in that story says, Odin, I know where you've hidden your eye in the famous waters of the well of Mimir. And she says that uh, Mimir can drink every day from the waters where your own eye drowns. Now, uh, in Snorri's prose Edda, 
Snorri says that Mimir has a well, Mimis Brunner, in Jotunheimr, implying that Mimir is a Jotun. Uh, and this whole thing contradicts the story he tells in Englinga Saga. At any rate, um, and that anyone who drinks from this well becomes wise. So Odin went and asked for a drink from it, and Mimir demanded that he pluck out an eye in exchange for that drink, which Odin did. Clearly, this is before Odin ever removed Mimir's head. Uh, the sequence of events uh, clearly puts him cutting out his eye first. So Odin is willing to sacrifice parts of himself, including a very essential, very painful part of himself. We also know that Odin sacrifices himself, potentially actually kills himself in sacrifice to himself to learn the runes. Uh, these are stanzas that I have quoted many a time in my various different videos because uh, they're compelling and, and they tie together so many different uh, aspects of, of these myths. But Hovmal 138 to 139, Veit ek at ek hek vinga me the o, natr alar niu, geri undadr o kevin othni, siolver siolvu mer, o the me the, erman giveit, versan av rotum rem. Vith levi mixeldu ne vith hornigi, nusta ek nither, nam ek up runar, upan denam, fell ek after thadan. So I know that I hung on a windswift tree all nine nights, nine whole nights, wounded by a spear and given to Odin myself to myself on that tree whose roots grow in a place no one has ever seen. No one gave me food, no one gave me drink. At the end, I peered down, I took the runes, screaming, I took them, and then I fell. So this is very mysterious, of course, the sacrifice of myself to myself. Um, and notice that the phrasing, given to Odin, uh, that's right there in the original of Norse, given Odni. And this is also said of humans that are sacrificed to Odin. They are given to Odin. So clearly he is being sacrificed in a way that's parallel to a human sacrifice. Uh, as we'll talk about in the same video here in a, in a few minutes. Um, a lot of people have noted parallels with the story of Christ and his crucifixion here. Uh, for example, Christ is pierced by a spear. Uh, John 19.34, one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Jesus also thirsts and is not given at least anything good to drink. Uh, John 19.28-29, uh, he saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And then Jesus also cries out loud, just as Odin does when he falls. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now I find this narrative of a god sacrificing himself to himself very compelling, and it's fascinating to see it come up in more than one place. Uh, of course, Odin explicitly says he sacrifices himself to himself. He is given by himself to himself, given to Odin. Uh, you could also read Christ's crucifixion that way, God the Son sacrificed to God the Father. Of course, it's, you know, that's not probably theologically a really sound way of putting it, but you could read it that way. Um, and I, I think that it's, there's something very compelling in the story, in the myth of the sacrificed God. Um, and I'm not surprised that it would come up in multiple cultures. And of course, there are parallels beyond uh, Christianity and, and, and Norse religion. But the specific parallels, like the spear and the thirsting and uh, the screaming, I don't think are actually very compelling. Odin is already very associated with the spear. Uh, one of our earliest known references to him is in, or datable references to him in Norse um, Literature is in the work of Bragi Borosan in the early 800s, the skald who already calls him Gungnis Vovather, the waver of Gungnir, his famous spear. Uh, similarly, Egil in the early 900s calls him Gers Drotin, Lord of the Spear. We often see him associated with Gungnir, his spear, uh, which was made for him by the dwarves. He loans it to uh, Dagar in one of the Helgi poems. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's a spearman. So, that he would be sacrificed with his own weapon is no big surprise, I think. And as to the hunger and the thirst and the screaming, those just strike me as very natural parts of someone being tormented. Uh, so I don't think they require uh, an explanation of, you know, borrowing from one uh, mythical tradition to another. Now, I will briefly mention that I am surprised at how often people ask me if it could go the other way. 
as the Christian story could be influenced by Havamal. But I think that the timeline and the geography and the geography of power and prestige really speak against that possibility. Uh, for one thing, we have no idea if the story of Odin hanging himself is as old as the crucifixion. Uh, Havamal may well date an oral composition to the 900s. The stories in it are probably older than that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a story recognizably the same was being told uh, at around the time the Christian Gospels were being written in the first century AD. And, uh, you know, I cannot imagine a person in the Mediterranean world of uh, the early Roman Empire, uh, whether their native language were uh, Greek or Aramaic uh, or, or Latin, uh, being interested enough in learning a Germanic language and in imitating uh, a myth from that source if it existed at that time. The reverse, however, is not true. In the 900s in the Norse-speaking world, there were definitely people who were aware of Christianity and even who had converted to it. Um, Christianity was clearly on the ascendancy in Europe at the time, so they would have been aware of it, and, and influence would be possible in that direction, I think. However, like I said, I don't think that it's necessary to explain the similarities between these stories um, by influence of one upon the other, uh, though I think that the commonalities in the stories are nonetheless compelling, uh, particularly as uh, portraits of, of us and our gods. Like I said, Odin, strongly associated with the spear, is also strongly associated with the noose. In fact, the skald Helgi Trausti in the mid-900s uh, calls Odin Golgavaldr, Lord of the Noose. Um, and uh, Oivindr the Plagiarist, around the same time, calls him Golga Farmer, the Lord of the Noose. So both a man um, perhaps in charge of who's getting hanged and someone who has been hanged himself. Um, Thorbjorn Brunason around 1000 calls him Hunga Heimthingadr, the one who visits the hanged man at home. Uh, in other poems he's called simply Hongatir, God of the Hangman, and Snorri adds Hungagud, also means God of the Hangman. Snorri also cites the title Draugadrotin in Inglinga Saga, that's Lord of the Undead, which may have something to do with him speaking to dead hanged men. Now, uh, as we mentioned, Odin's hanged himself. He is uh, a hanged god, but he receives human sacrifices in a very similar way by hanging and by spearing. Uh, and uh, for a prime example of this, we can turn to the story in Gautrek's saga about the hero Starkadr. Now Starkadr was traveling with a Viking crew led by a king, Vikar, and uh, they were sailing and they came to an island where they had uh, no wind. And uh, they were far from sight of any other land, so they cast lots. They engaged in some kind of divination. We don't know uh, what this divination was specifically, um, as the sagas are very unclear about it. Uh, we, it just seems that it involves casting some kind of wooden chips. Uh, maybe these had runes on them or other symbols on them, but we just don't know. Anyone who tells you they know how divination was done in the Norse world is not known. And uh, anyway, the lots continue to say that what they need to do, no matter how many times they, they recast them, you know, best two out of three, um, they keep saying, kill your king, sacrifice your king. Well, King Vikar doesn't like this, and so he convinces the men, <laughs> you can imagine the scene, uh, to, uh, to hold off for a night. And uh, that night, to make a long story short, Starkather is visited by Odin, who asks him to sacrifice the king in the morning and gives him a reed. Now, this is Wyoming. It's pretty arid. Uh, I don't even know where I'd go to get a reed, but, um, you know, a plant, you know, long, straight plant like this. So, uh, in the morning, uh, Stark either goes to Vikar and says, my lord, let's sacrifice you symbolically. Um, instead of throwing a spear at you, I'll throw this reed at you. Instead of hanging you for real, We'll use the intestine of this calf that we killed for our breakfast. This is the Middle Ages, so they travel with, uh, with, their, uh, with their livestock. They can't just go to Taco John's in the morning. So they wrap uh, this uh, calf intestine around his neck, tie it to a low-hanging limb of a weak tree, put the king up on a stump, and then, so he's hanging, but not really, and then Starkather throws this reed at him. But as he does, he says, 
Nu gev ek thik othni. Now I give you to Odin. Notice that phrasing, give, just as Odin is given to himself. So now I give you to Odin, throws this reed, which turns into a spear, pierces the king, and then the uh, calf intestine turns into a real noose, and uh, the small tree he was hanging from starts growing, and so he is lifted into the sky, truly hanging and truly pierced by a spear, truly given to Odin. Now, the saga itself is not very old, but it's certainly based on some older material, and the, uh, the similarity of the sacrifice of Vikar to Odin, being given to Odin, to Odin's sacrifice to himself, is pretty compelling. Uh, there's also a somewhat lesser-known story, the tale of Styrbjorn, Styrbjarnathotr, includes, uh, includes this scene. I'll, I'll give you my translation of this. That same night, Erekr, this is uh, Styrbjorn's enemy, went into Odin's temple and gave himself to him, Gafskonum. So here we have, again, apparently a sacrifice of himself to Odin, but without dying right away, a, uh, a delayed dying, uh, gave himself to him for victory, and he asked for a ten-year gap before his own death. He had already sacrificed a great deal because victory looked unlikely. A little later, he saw a big man with a wide-brimmed hat. This man put a reed in his hand, uh, and told him to throw it over Styrbjorn's army and to say this, Odin all either Allah. Odin owns you all. So again, we see the spear uh, and, and disguised as a reed again, uh, as a weapon of Odin in taking dead men for himself. And uh, it is not only with spears. Uh, hanging alone is, is mentioned by Adam of Bremen in his description of the temple at Uppsala. He does not specifically say that these are sacrifices to Odin, but he does mention uh, that every nine years the Swedes execute nine head of nine different species, including men, by hanging during a festival that lasts nine days. All those nines make me think that this is Norse in origin, uh, as, as Adam wouldn't have a reason to think that nine was a sacred number to them. Uh, we also read in uh, writers in the mid-500s like Procopius and, and Jordanes speaking of uh, in the case of Procopius, men of Thule, um, the vague old Greek word for, for people the far north. Uh, and Jordana speaking of the Goths as hanging men for the war god. Procopius says Ares, uh, Jordana says Mars, because of course they're classical writers uh, writing in the classical tradition where every god of every pantheon is identified as a Greek or Roman god. Uh, but the uh, notion of hanging men to a war god uh, strikes me as a uh, probably related to the tradition of hanging men as sacrifices to Odin. Um, I do not think that just because it says Mars that we have to think this means Tyr. I don't think that that, that interpretation holds. Just because uh, Mars Day becomes Tyr's Day uh, doesn't mean that another Roman or Greek observer wouldn't think the war god was Odin, which actually makes more sense from what we know of him from Norse mythology. And in Ingling Saga, we hear of other people sacrificed uh, to Odin, or weirdly sacrificed kind of through Odin's agency. For instance, King Aun, who will live forever if he gives one of his own sons to Odin every tenth year. All right, that's pretty strange. Um, th how they are sacrificed, I don't recall. I don't believe it's by hanging. I don't think it's actually specified. And also in Ingling Saga, we read about a King Oliver of the Swedes who is burned inside his house and given to Odin, his people Golfu Han Odni. And they sacrificed him, it says, for a good harvest. Bletu honum til ors ser. So, there's fairly compelling evidence that at least there's a literary tradition of men being sacrificed to Odin. Uh, there's also, of course, art, such as the Ardra 8 picture stone uh, from Sweden. It's difficult to date these stones physically or chemically, but uh, the art style suggests this is from the 700s or 800s. We have what appears to be Odin riding his eight-legged horse Sleipnir. Uh, and some men hanging uh, in the uh, bottom left of that image that I'll put up on the screen right here. Uh, that may well be evidence of a parallel custom uh, early in the Viking Age, long before any of these written sources were put, uh, put down in ink. So I remain uh, engrossed by this interesting characterization of Odin, not only as someone who wants people, quote, given to him, but will even accept himself given to him. Uh, who speaks with the dead as often as he speaks with the living, and seems to emerge from the process wiser, just as we may, if we read the words of the dead 
that survive in their uh, ancient and medieval literature. All right, well, folks, I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Uh, I hope you'll check out some of my other videos if you haven't before. I have uh, about 250, including uh, a very detailed read-through of the poem Halvamal, going through each stanza and explaining what it means in Old Norse. I've also translated the Poetic Edda and the Saga of the Volsungs, and uh, I will soon, not soon, uh, probably, probably 2021, 2022, my translation of the Prose Edda, which will include the Saga of the Inglings, will be out. Uh, so look for that in the future. And, and my um, audiobook of the Poetic Edda, narrated by me, will be coming out on uh, November 13th. Well, for now, from beautiful Wyoming, I'm wishing you the best.